welcome back to the second ever live stream. So today what we're planning to do is a couple of things. Firstly, I have a kit. Can you hear me or not? You should be able to hear me on this one. The microphones. Can you hear it? It says. Oh, okay, you can hear it on, you should be able to hear it on that one. And on. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Slight flaw in this plan there might have boosted it up a bit but hopefully we'll stick on this camera and then you can see me and what i'm doing cool so yeah a couple of things we're doing today one i'm going to be building this because that's something i need to get done and hopefully i can tell you a bit about the parts what was easy to get not easy to get that sort of thing uh, just in case you wanted to build yours entirely from scratch and not just buy a kit from Bridget themselves and also, I want to talk a little bit about power supplies and what's safe, reliable, or not safe or not reliable, and maybe using ATX power supplies from computers and things like that, or versus, you know, the standard cheap ones from China. There's sort of different different levels of interest there, so uh, we'll see how we go. And then obviously drop in any questions you want about Steve or just general 3D printing stuff. And I'll answer those when I can. We're up to four people already, hooray. So I'm just gonna stop getting on with this and talking about what I'm doing. Well, this is probably worth noting at the start. This is nice. I basically had a bunch of, so in the past I've sold plates like this, three mil thick, but they didn't have quite so many additional features. So this one is part of a six mil aluminium frame that I've, I say designed, it's not really designed because it's sort of Prusa, sort of, uh, what was it? The P3 steel is a sort of combination of those two things. And it's basically a big thick frame. And this is one of the extra parts I got so I could build a sort of original kit from this sort of stuff. So the reason for all these extra holes is basically you have, what's the best way to show you this? So by this slot, you have four holes here and that's for those uh, bearings with casings. Ah, why build one more i3 printer instead of a Core XY one? Uh, that's a good question. I don't, I wouldn't necessarily say that Core i, the Core, core i3, I wouldn't necessarily say Core XY is better than an i3, and I already have one i3, so I'm just sort of, I don't know. There's no real reason for using i3 over Core XY or vice versa, but Prusa printers are quite popular, so I thought I wanted to have one myself, but I didn't want to buy a kit, so I'm just doing it myself. Mostly the answer to that would be because reasons. Could have done Core XY, but decided to go with this instead. So yeah, we have bearing options here. There's five, so you can have either two and one, like would be in standard printers, or you can go with a two and two, like you have a sum. The set of four holes is for those bearings with a big casing around them. So if you want to use those, you can put those in. And then there's a set of three sort of merged on either side for different size fixings. You should be able to, well, I can't be bothered to dig anything out. 
but that's just for different size things and whatever you want to use. So it basically gives you lots of different options. Again, mounting holes through the center for that, uh, the belt holder, plenty of options there, depending on what you want to do. So I'll probably, I don't want to commit to anything, but I'll, I want to try and sell off some of these because a lot of print bids you get are just rubbish and they warp with the heat and ruin everything for you. So if I can, I'm going to try and get some at half decent price so we can all have one of those. Well, oh, sorry, hopefully that wasn't really loud. Let's find some instructions. That's the first thing I need to do. So today we are just going to be doing the uh, the y-axis assembly. So, you know, the base part where the carriage slides. And I'm not going to be going any further than that. Sorry if you're expecting like the whole thing. I just, I don't have the whole kit yet, but I have everything for this first stage. So getting on with this and then more in the future. Now, at the moment I am in the progress of moving house, which is why I'm not actually uploading videos and stuff. It was just, I don't have time to be editing loads of videos. So that's why I'm going with this option of hopefully a reasonably good stream for you all to enjoy with a little bit less of my time consumed. Basically, I've printed off all the parts that I think I need. I went through the guide first and extracted basically a bill of materials. And then from that, I bought what I needed. And now I have hopefully everything in this basket needed for that first stage assembly. Mouth's starting to dry out already because I'm talking way too much. <laughs> Always happens that way. Actually, <clears throat> quickly before we get into uh, anything else, has anybody else picked up some of this? And have you started printing with it yet? The Tom's 3D Blue PLA that's sort of slightly sparkly. Can you see? Uh, you probably can't see the sparkles in it, but it's a sort of sparkly PLA. I haven't tried printing with it yet. Has anyone given it a go? And it got some nice blue stickers as well. Don't know quite what I'm going to do with those, but there you go. Uh, I love how the first step of this is just like all the things. <laughs> Yeah, I imagine a lot of people are joining in filament. The thing with filament is so easy to buy, isn't it? It's just, you think, well, I've got a printer, so I'll print with it eventually. I'll just get all the things and then hope for the best. I'm sure I'll finish it one day, but unfortunately you end up buying things faster than you use them and thus you never actually get rid of it. So those that don't know about these Prusa assembly things, they do provide a full manual online, but they don't provide a bill of materials, which is a little unfortunate. So in order to get, oh God, this is gonna take ages. In order to get the list of parts that you actually need, you have to sort of extract it yourself. When this build is all complete and I know that my bill of materials is correct, I will probably publish it. Goodness. Just so more people can use it if they want to. Sorry for the slightly rubbishy webcam on my face today. I decided since I was doing the build, I put the higher definition one down here. So hopefully you can see, this is ridiculous. Hopefully you can see a bit better what I'm doing and you don't need to see my face particularly that much anyway. <laughs> so these threaded rods are one thing. So. I'm sure you've seen the original Prusa, they have black rods. So I sort of assumed, maybe shouldn't have assumed that they were uh, basically hardened self color. So that when you have black stuff, that's generally just called self color. I'm not actually sure why it's called self color, but I'm sure it's to do with the finishing process and that's the color it goes. I'm not sure, but it's very hard material. So you shouldn't really try and cut it, which I did <laughs> and it's not easy to cut because it's very because really? it's very hard typical printers don't particularly work that well even worse I now have 1.75 and 3mm filament 
So stock double the filament. Yeah, I mean, that's the one thing that I've wanted to try and avoid because it's tempting to go for printers or even to try the Bowden setups because the Ultimaker 3, in fact, all the Ultimakers use the 3 millimeter filament. So you've got some reason to believe that using 3 millimeter is a good idea. But yeah, I'd rather just stick with 175 now I've got a lot of it. Well, to be honest, I think I probably don't have as much as a lot of people by the sounds of it. I have, oh, I can't see them at the moment. I've started packing them up. I think I have probably seven, eight rolls of various filaments, but I don't have like, I have a, probably a couple of ABS and then a couple of PLA and then one of a few other things. I have a lot of samples. I bought quite a lot of like different interesting things that I thought, oh yeah, I'll try that. And then I never get around to trying it. So. I didn't consider how boring this first part of assembly could be. It's not particularly fun to watch, is it? Basically threading nuts onto black rods for five minutes. <laughs> and hopefully we've got that right. Two of those, two of those, one of those, one of those. Two of those, two of those, excellent. So let's start our little discussion about power supplies. So the reason I'm asking is I, at the moment, use mostly those, uh, I think they call them LED power supplies. So power supplies sort of semi-designed for use with LEDs. Buy them from AliExpress or Banggood or wherever, and the quality is really bad. And I just don't trust them to continue working while I'm not here. So any prints I do, I make sure that they're finished before I leave the house. So I'll run them if I'm in a different room. But if I leave the house, then I'll make sure they're off just because I don't trust the quality of those, those components. Now, because I'm moving, I want to be able to print this sort of thing, keep my printer running when I'm not there. And to do that, I need to be able to trust it. We don't quite fit. I'm not sure how you're supposed to assemble this. Let's leave that up now. So yeah, to get the better reliability, I was planning to use computer power supplies. Regarding PCs, I've run China PCs, but they hardly last with 12 volt high load. Yeah, presume, I mean, a lot of the time with these power supplies, they don't actually, the, the ratings they put on them are probably not very realistic for what they can actually manage. I think you get that a lot with cheap computer power supplies as well. They'll put the maximum rating for short usage rather than continuous. So a high quality power supply would be like 750 watt continuous and 900 watts peak. So it can deliver a high amount of current for a short period of time, but then it has to drop back to a continuous load that it can manage, which is lower. And that's probably the case with these. We, I mean, we buy something that says 350 watts. That's probably the peak output and the continuous is more like 250. So if you're running a, a continuous 300, then it's gonna break. But if they don't publish figures, which they, they don't, they just, <laughs> they look like things that they're not. You don't really know what the genuine figure should be. So I never cheap out on stuff that separates you from mains voltage. Yeah, I mean, that's pretty much. But then to me, there's two things. There's, I mean, AliExpress is obviously on the very cheap side, but at the same time, if I want, I mean, at the moment I have a silicon bed that is a little bit over the top. It's 200 watt bed on 12 volts, which I know not a great idea. It's a little bit too silly. It's too high current, but it does work with a, uh, an external MOSFET. So regardless of that not being a great idea, say I'm continuing with that. Would it be better to power it off an ATX power supply or try and buy a high quality LED power supply? 
Well, I looked at high quality LED power supplies from the likes of RS Components and Varnell and Mauser, 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 whatever it's called. Sort of fairly large industrial printing places, but the, for that sort of wattage, you pay a lot of money. I mean, I'm happy to spend, I mean, what the AliExpress ones, like $20 or something for pretty much any size, 15 to $30, something in that range, which converts pounds, whatever. But it's in that range. I would be happy to spend sort of 80 quid, 90 quid, 100 quid on a good quality power supply. But I'm not sure I'd be happy to spend like 200 or 300, which just seems to be what they go for. I mean, that's probably a product of my uh, my requirements being a little bit on the ridiculous side. But I want to find a happy medium. And I think a computer power supply might be that because you can get a few hundred watts for less than 100 pounds and you can be pretty sure it's good quality but then the wiring is not really suitable you can't have single wire because they're all designed for like the same wattage but across a number of components Ugh. i never guessed how long it would take to thread these on i think because of this coating if you can you see that fairly decent it's quite a matte coating so they don't they don't spin <laughs> so i have to just do them uh, yeah, this one comes in down here. Tiny bit at a time. Do I have any plans for building an SLS? Uh, do you mean building as in designing or building as in getting a kit? Because I have considered getting a kit, but I've not considered designing one. I don't think I know enough about SLS printers to be able to design one. I what I did with, well, I've had, I've been around FDM printers for a few years, but I think if I was to try and design an SLS printer, I'd want to buy one first. And then by buying one and building a kit, you really get a good sense of how it works, why it works, what are the components required to execute it, what are the downsides, and then where can it be improved. So if I was to try and do it, that would be the way I go about it. I'd do. I'd get a kit that sort of teaches me what's what doesn't work well but in terms of really designing one at the moment I'm not really in that market it's not excuse me the level of detail that they provide is not something I'm really looking for and also the level of hassle <laughs> Should we come and put a bit of quiet background music on? Let's see if I can, this could be a bit risky. In fact, I'm not gonna be able to hear it anyway. Let's. Yeah, so with an ATX power supply, I, the one, the thought, blabbering my words about the, what I, the thing that I wanted to do is basically take the cover off, look for the points where those 12 volt wires go in, because there's obviously a number of them, and basically put in some pretty fat gauge wires, so all those wires just come into two large gauge wires that I can then use as I like, or maybe split them a couple of ways. Because, I mean, a high quality ATX power supply could run like 750 watts without a problem. I have a 750 watt power supply. So that could probably run more than one printer, realistically. They only use high wattage on startup. Yeah. I do sort of want 24 volt system because I know, as you say, it's generally probably a better idea just because you end up with lower currents for the same power. But now that I've bought like a bunch of 12 volt power supplies, I'd end up in that situation where that you're in with filament and I don't want to have 12 volt and 24 volt systems. I want to have, if I have three 20, uh, if I have three 12 volt printers and one of the power supplies breaks, I can put in a spare 12 volt. If I have two 12 and one 24 and I only keep a 12 volt in stock, then I can't replace the one in the 24 volt. I have to keep more stock in order to have them to replace. If that makes sense. <laughs>
Huh, so, progress. We're not getting very far, really. It's a start. Can you... Yeah, okay. I thought I thought the stream had stopped for a second. That was weird. That's there, that's there, that's there. Oh, by the way, you, uh, for anyone that was here last week, you might have seen my uh, my Prusa printer running, my Cintron. You can see it in the background under under here. It was running fine. It'd been running fine for weeks, and I printed a bunch of stuff. But now the the uh, the external MOSFET is just not responding for some reason. So, unfortunately, there's no featured print today. How do the prints from Street compare to the prints from some of the 3D printer kits you've built? Uh, I've not built that many. The only two I've built, the only kit I've built is that Cintron there, which I've upgraded massively. It's not very similar other than the original frame. Uh, but the prints compared to that are so much better. So one of the main thing, one of the main problems you have with cheaper three D printers is the quality of the frame and the sturdiness of the frame. So as you get movement and momentum and inertia, rotational inertia, as you accelerate in opposite directions, the vibrations and whatnot move through the frame, which end up translating to the print because it moves the head. One of the big advantages of the cube box aluminium frame of Steve is it becomes so more so much more rigid that you don't get all that wobble in the head or in the bed. So regardless of the kinematics, you get a better print purely because you have less movement and motion in the frame. I think we might have done step one. Screw the nuts on and place washers. Ensure initial 100 millimeter distance between a washer after counter nut, after counter nut, and the y-axis corner. Use a photo as a reference. 100 millimeters between the washer. I think. Oh, where's my bedrooms? Yeah. Tuning jerk and acceleration settings makes a massive difference. It's funny how the standard settings in Marlin for acceleration are quite high. Oh, I think so anyway, especially if you want good quality. If you look at, who's the, Lulzbot, their acceleration settings in jerk are quite low because that fast acceleration causes so much vibration through the printer. It just destroys quality. Uh, so if I set these to 100 millimeters, that'll do. Oh, by the way, did you notice I put the uh, the chat on the screen this time? I noticed while watching the live stream back, I didn't obviously watch all of my own live stream, but I had a quick look at it and you obviously couldn't see the chat. So that's going to be difficult for people to watch it back. So I've added the chat. So when I'm responding, it's all sort of mirrored. When I'm responding to questions, you can know the question, the question that is being answered. I knew there was a reason people put chat on their streams and I found out what it is. I'm building my printer from scratch and I can't find out which power supply to get. My printer has one stepper motor for each axis, two more for the extruders and heated bed. One stepper motor for each axis. Yeah, X, Y, Z. Two extruders. And heated bed. Well, the load from stepper motors is fairly low. Uh, what did I work it out to be? So on Steve, we got the hot end, the E3D V6, 
with the cartridge heater, which is originally 30 watts, but you can get 40 watt versions. And five stepper motors. One, two, three, four. Yeah, and five stepper motors was about 80 watts. So take off the 30 for the what's it? So we're down to, well, let's say 70. It was about 70 under load with the 80 watt power supply. So 70 down to 40. So five motors is 40 watts. So it's about eight watts each. So if you allow 10 watts for each of your stepper motors, plus the wattage of the heated bed, and then a little bit of extra headroom, oh, sorry, plus your hot end, plus headroom for the, for the board itself and the losses in the power supply, then you should be pretty good. If you get, if you, if all that adds up to about uh, 150, 200 watts, don't go for something that's like 180 because it's close. Go for something that's above, always above, never below. The last thing you want is not enough power. Um, la, la, la. Oh, I reset my 100 millimeters. Oh, from here. Mr. Poof, 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 what sort of size things do you print? Is it sort of like cosplay sort of size, like physical human scale? Or is it sort of lots of little things? I'm just interested in when people want the high speed versus the super high precision. Just so you know, parts that are easy to get on here and parts that are not easy to get. Obviously, printed parts, easy to print. Just You just print them. Uh, M10 lock nuts, pretty easy to get. That's what these thinner nuts are called, lock nuts, because they're normally used for... So if you have just one nut and you tighten it up against something and the whole thing vibrates, it can come loose. So that's bad, obviously. You can use things like lock tuts and night lock tuts lock nuts and Loctite and things like that, other prevailing torque systems. But one other way you can do it is by basically having a single nut, pretend that's a normal size nut, and just turning this one up against it and literally jamming it against that one. By You then tighten them in opposite directions and they stay tight. So the way nuts and bolts work and hold tight and grab things together is by basically extending the length of this thread. So as you pull these nuts close together like this and you tighten them against each other, the thread there between the nuts gets extended and that's what's pulling everything together. So that's that extra tension in the in the threaded bar needs to prevail past the end of here. Hopefully that's a reasonable explanation. I don't look at it in fine detail, but it's useful to have a little bit of knowledge about how these things work. I think so, anyway. Okay, well, I, I generally print mechanical parts as well, yeah. I do totally agree, though. It's, it's nice to have things print fast, but I suppose it depends if you're printing for a specific purpose, like if, I, if I've if i broken something and I want a new one as quick as possible, then I do want it just to print fast and get over and done with. But if I sort of planned in a print that's gonna be four hours, I'm gonna do it at this time, it's gonna take four hours, then it doesn't really bother me if it takes four hours because I already knew that that's how long it was gonna take. Also, one of the safety features of my printer, I don't like leaving my printer unattended. So fast printing with more full time, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I really want to be able to print away from my printer and trust it, but 
even with like all the safety features in the world, it's still difficult to persuade yourself that this hot thing melting plastic all over the place is safe to leave. I think we're good enough on the first step there. Let's put those to one side. And start twiddling some more nuts. Oh, it's a daisy. I make things now. Thank you so much. So it should be around 12 volts, 200 watts, between 20 amps and 30 amps. Isn't it? So 12 volts, 20 amps would be 240 watts. 12 volts, 30 amps would be 360 watts. So watts, just in case you didn't know, is volts times amps. Sometimes volts are, writ are, what are written down as volt amps. If anyone knows why, I'd like to know. Obviously, sort of, that's still correct because it is volts times amps, but it's not, it's not really a unit of measure, is it? Volt amps. So who else is printing things today? Who's got a print going while sitting here? What are you printing? I think it was a bad decision doing this. Sorry, I've not really paid attention to what the camera is. is. You probably can't see a lot of what I'm doing. Sorry about that. Getting a bit bit new to this, a bit new to this, trying to get it right. What do we reckon? That's about in the middle. I think there's, tells you what you have to get right anyway. Did I mention before that I had to cut? Oh no, why isn't that going on? Oh, it's a ship nut. Come on, please go on. Yeah, cutting hardened threaded rods is not fun <laughs> by any means. I I didn't realise they were hardened to begin with. I should have I should have known. Uh, but I, I went ahead and thought, yeah, I'll just use axe or it'll be fine. They won't be that hard. And then I started cutting. I was like, this is definitely hard. <laughs> this is definitely pretty hard. And after about two minutes of cutting, I'd gone a quarter, a quarter of the way through the bar and the, uh, the hacksaw was just blocked. There's no teeth left. So I went back to the Dremel and just span it up to maximum and just cut through. But absolutely rinsed through the cutting disc. This didn't last very long at all. Let's get that, that's there, that's there. Let's get a couple of these on the ends. Hmm, another set of parts for Steve, nice. You wouldn't believe the amount of parts, that amount of spare parts I have for Steve. Well, it's not, I wouldn't say spare parts. Duplicate parts would be more accurate. Stuff that I printed while designing it and then changed it a little bit and printed another one. Changed it a little bit and printed another one. Got so many spare parts now. Because a lot of the geometry is quite similar, so 
even if they were the ones that were specifically designed for, well, specifically the correct design, they still pretty much work. I would have liked to get black nuts and stuff for this, but they were a little bit more expensive and I just didn't think it was worth it. I think it'll still look pretty good. Hello, Dinash. Welcome to the stream. So, step it goes on there. Ooh, didn't want to do that. <laughs> damn, damn it. Uh, the switch goes on there. Touchy, switchy, motion, deliciousness. I could put this uh, it might be quite difficult let's just go with what I've got okay so this is where I've got to this is there's no gaps between the parts <laughs> really shock horror so I've got that now Screw nuts and place washers and wine motor parts and threaded rods are shown. Somewhere in the middle, the precise position doesn't matter at this time. It's all the correct orientation of the wine motor part. Correct orientate. How can you orientate it incorrectly at this moment? Like in you just rotate. <laughs> how can you get it wrong? It literally has no relevance. Symbol the y axis front stay oh basically the same thing for the front. If anyone is gonna build one of these prusas from a kit from uh, from not the original kit and going by yourself by your own, I try and get the threaded rods cut to length. Definitely a lot easier to do that way. Right, back to the building. Like, should we just move this up here? Yes? Yes. Now you can see a little bit more of this thing down here. Don't need the ties. Don't forget. Oh, guess what we're going to do now? Thread nuts onto rods for five minutes. Does anyone have any more questions about Steve? Well, here it is a good opportunity. If not, I shall tell you a little bit about what I'd like to do with Steve. So, if you've been looking at the page or you knew when Steve was released, you'll know that it's been quite a little while since I've added any new things. The reason for that mainly is because work got very busy and moved so I've had very little time to actually work on these things, hence the less videos as well, unfortunately. But there's a couple of things I want to try adding and I think the design is capable of doing. So there are probably three things. So the did I upload the enclosure stuff? I must have done. I possibly didn't. Let's just check. Because uh, the, the enclosure, I the, like the design of the enclosure is pretty much there. It's pretty simple. I'm not sure quite how people are going to be making it. That's the one downside that I'm a little bit disappointed about. It's not that easy to actually make. I mean, even once you've got the design, unless you know how to use a, a jigsaw and things like that, then possibly not that easy to actually make. 
but the design is pretty much there it's very simple it's just literally a few panels that bolt on the sides i put some extra holes in them for helping you route the wires around so just little like cable tie holes which you can slip them through and back and it just holds to the frame uh, so that's the first thing the enclosure second thing that i've wanted to do pretty much from day one is have an option for mgn 12 rails now the downside to this, which I've not found a good way around yet, is that you can't really use those rails with the enclosure. Because I went for 2020 extrusion and the MGN12 carriages is slightly wider than uh, the 20mm. If you mount it essentially on those on those rails, it doesn't really it doesn't really work out in your favour. Which is a little bit irritating. Because that would have been really nice. But I'll just have to find a different way around that. Uh, what else are we going to do? Uh, multi material. I've not. What's everyone's opinions on multi material? So, I mean, obviously, the purpose of multi material originally was for separate support material. So you have dissolvable support. I'm pretty sure that was the first reason people wanted uh, to have dual extrusion. But. Breakaway supports are just a lot easier and don't have the hassles of that dual extrusion problem. Personally, I've no real massive benefit from dual extrusion. I just, if it's very popular and everyone wants it, then it might be something to look into, but I, I just can't see the advantages. Well, no, that's not true. I can see the advantages, but there is plenty of hassle behind it and don't think it's something I'm going to be doing, to be honest. So now we're just moving down a little bit. Oh, this can't go in a very good place, can it? Okay, well. So we've done this part now. That's that bit sorted. That's that. So now fully assemble the y-axis stage. Given dimensions are recommended, not absolute. Use them as a guidance for your assembly. Your final versions can slightly differ. I'm still waiting for the slicer software to get better for dual extrusion. Yeah, I'm I'm pretty agreed with that. Prime towers are such a waste. They should be, in my mind, well, unless the materials are significantly different, in which case you probably wouldn't want it, using that prime tower in the infill. I mean, if you're printing with dissolvable material inside, then that's probably not a good idea, especially if it's not watertight. But yeah, having like half <laughs> half the plastic of a printer being wasted in a dual extrusion, just I think dual extrusion could be good for multi-material, but multi-color seems silly. Yeah, <laughs> the multi-color, well, I don't know what multi-color you're thinking of specifically, but <laughs> the one I've seen where it all just sort of merges into a, a one nozzle and basically everything just comes out a shade of brown. <laughs> Why would you want that? Oh, it's pretty colors. Actually, no, it's just brown, just slightly different browns. Is it a yellowy brown or is it a yes, less yellowy brown? Oh, it's a very nice yellowy brown. Mm, I'm sure it is. I mean, if you want a coloured print, just print it and paint it. This is just. Oh, sorry, forgot the washers. Yeah. I don't think FDM style was really designed for colour prints. Well, to say what it's designed for is not. It was really a limiting, putting a limiting factor on the technology, but I don't think that's where it's heading, put it that way. I think what would be interesting would be a printer that you can just load, say you have like four different material filaments. You could just load them all into the printer and it would manually load and unload and switch them between prints. So it's not necessarily a multi-material print. So each print is a multi-material, 
but you don't have to manually switch between prints. So I think that one could be quite useful. I mean, it's not, it's by no means groundbreaking, but it's one of those like nice usability features. It would mean you can have your printer remotely. So if you like printing those highly toxic things like I do, such as ABS, which is not particularly delicious, then you can keep your printer completely remote and you don't have to even go to it to change filaments around. You can't even see what I'm doing. I'm sorry. Sorry, 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 sorry. Here we go. Oh, that's weird. You can see you can see the stream through the through the through the stream. Streamception. Yeah, you can see some applications for multiple material, for example, embedding flexibles into your model. I think, to be honest, that's quite a common thing. I'm not saying well, it's common; everyone says it, but it's a. You see it around a lot. People saying, "Oh, you can, you could basically have a single body part that has multiple materials." So you can have rigid one end, both ends, and then a flexible part in the middle, and it's all one piece. But even if you could print them all out on one uh, on one printer, I still can't see that being. I don't know. I think there wouldn't there be because by nature flexible materials are different to rigid materials, obviously. So do they bond the same? I mean, just because they're both printed sort of in one part, are they still gonna join well? If you'll have like an interlocking bit, are you just gonna break at the interlocking section because of the way the filament changes and switches or whatever and you get weaker joints? <laughs> Don't cross the streams. <laughs> I'm not crossing streams, there's a difference. <laughs> no. Don't cross streams, that's very naughty. I prefer the term streamception. Just for my own reference, whereabouts is everyone from? I don't mean like specifically, I don't want to know where you live, but what country? Just so I know what sort of time zone this time suits. Because for me, this is quite a good time. Sunday afternoon, just relaxing. What time people, what time people receive this well? Are you watching it over breakfast or something? I mean, 52 minutes could be pretty long for breakfast. From Germany. Hooray for Germany. I've never actually been to Germany. If I was to go to Germany, where should I go? Brazil and Norway and east coast of the US. And that's pretty much everyone. There's only five people and one of them is probably me. <laughs> There's quite a broad scope for five people to be on. Germany, Brazil, Norway and the east coast of America. Well, thank you all for being here, because <laughs> you're clearly not in the same time zone I am. No, I didn't expect such a broad scope of people, actually. Because this time has been pretty inconvenient for some of you. Just seems like a pretty terrible time for, for watching stuff. Or maybe, what time is it for you? Like early morning maybe? Mid-afternoon? 
<laughs> I don't even know. I didn't do the calculations in my head. I just said things. Right, now I've got to get all the measurements right on this. Got this on here. I didn't cut my threaded rod particularly precisely because I it was always going to be better to have it too long than too short. After all, you can cut longer, you can't cut shorter. Oh no, the other... <laughs> you can... Excuse me. You can cut shorter, but you can't cut it longer. Right. Solid as a rock. <laughs> right, let's get this. Right. 77... Good question. The sites in, I guess, Berlin. Lots of history on East West July there. Oh, yes. <laughs> Yeah. Is it very different still, East West Berlin? Are they sort of. Are they now. That's probably a bit of an ignorant question. But is there still a big. I mean, obviously, there's not a physical divide, but is there a. Is there a divide sort of in other ways? 77. I think what I need to do is tighten I remember assembling my Centron the first time having this sort of problem. Everything just gets a little bit... fiddly. Oh. I was like, I can't put it on. Sorry, you're not going to be able to see this very well. I think it's pretty evident what I'm doing. You can see it a bit. Another question to all of you. What other technologies do you want to see in 3D printing? I mean, we talked about multi-material is sort of one idea that's coming through, developing. Are there any other things that you want to see? Like, I mean, materials are developing a lot. Do we need better ways to be able to print better materials? Is it just nozzles? Do we want like quick change nozzles and things like that? Personally, I don't really change nozzles because I always pretty much go for soft filaments that don't require harder nozzle. But I don't know, are there different things that you want to see that you're just not getting out of it?
improvements on electronic software, everything is much open loop. Yeah, so closed feedback loops for things like stepper motors and yeah. For those that don't know, the difference between open loop and closed back in that sort of sense is uh, in open back, in open back, closed back, open loop or closed loop systems. In an open loop system, you have your input, your control, and then the output, and it just happens in those orders. It's like an instruction and it's executed. In a closed loop system, you'll have a feedback loop. So you have your instruction and then your compute and then your output. And then the output will also feed back to a point between the input and the compute. So the, the input combines with what it's already got, if you like, or the current motion or the current velocity or something like that. And that feeds into the calculation to give you a better performance output. It also means you can track, you sort of know more accurately the position. So for like when a stepper motor skips at the moment in an open loop system, it executed or it tried to execute those commands it failed, but the system has no knowledge of that. So with a closed loop system, it would know that it skipped and it can go, oh, I skipped and I skipped this amount. So now I need to go back this amount so I don't end up with a massive offset layer. So yeah, for software control, that would be quite interesting. It would definitely bring, well, yeah, that would be quite a big change, I think, too. But it's, it's still going to drive things towards cheap systems potentially, because when you've got open loop, uh, closed loop systems like that, you can almost get away with more. That's something I'd like to see: less cheap printers. <laughs> so many people are just driving to make the cheapest and cheapest and cheapest. It's just... much like to have fewer cheap printers there. They do ruin everything. Not everything. But yeah. I really didn't want to be using an adjustable gluing spanner. They're so rubbish. <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't have two 17mm spanners or two 13mm spanners. Okay, that end's looking pretty good. I probably made a mistake somewhere, but let's worry about that another time. Filament width sensors, jam detection, run out detection, yeah. Would it though? Would it really increase the cost that much, do you think? I mean, for something like, I mean, yeah, I mean, if you're looking at accurate sensors, but filament, like filament fail feed detection, just, or running out of filament, jam detection, those things are not that complicated. I don't know if you saw, there was a guy on the 3D printing group that posted his little widget thing with a, a little wheel and sensor and stuff that does jam detection, run out detection, and it doesn't do, did it do, it did some sort of width detection, but I'm not sure how it fed that back in the feedback loop. Hmm. It would be pretty fancy. So this 60, 65 here, uh, let's do this side first.
lot of it could be done with the motor driver chip. TMC2130 with proper software could do it. So the stepper driver itself. So is there, how does that work? Presumably the spinner, the spinning of the stepper motor provides some change in the current in the motor that it can detect on the driver. Presumably. Yeah, I mean, if it's just software implementation, presumably they're quite quite expensive stepper drivers, though. Definitely compared to the uh, the super cheap version from China, which is not even. You'd have it in this directional encoder to monitor the actual movement of the steppers, and that means more inputs. And this can detect the skip accurately. Back EMF, and it can detect stools stru this way. Sounds like everything we've got is there. Everything we've got, everything we need is there. Yeah. But are they going to. See, the thing is, unless those things, are there other way to solve those problems? That's the thing, isn't it? If filament runout detection, or what What did you say? Uh, jam detection. So, say for example, oops, it so the need to detect a jam is there because it jams. So if you could find a way to stop the jamming, then you wouldn't need to find a way to detect it, if that makes sense. That you only need to detect a jam if you expect to potentially get one. If you could find a way to stop any sort of jamming, then you wouldn't need jam detection. TMC 2130 are like ten dollars, ten euros each. Well, is that really expensive though? I mean, if you were to gain, I suppose you'd need quite a few, wouldn't you? It's not a ten dollar <laughs> investment. But realistically, if you were to change from say AE1988, whatever they are, to the 2130, TMC 2130, and with that upgrade, you've got the detection. I mean, for me, what was that? If you put, you maybe let's say five, a fifty dollar investment into more accurate. Presumably, there do like one twenty eight micro stepping or whatever. Yeah, five standard stepper drivers for five dollars. Shit. <laughs> Five euros. Why do I say everything is dollars? I mean, yeah, if you compare it to that, then it is a big difference. And if you're only looking at having a $200 printer, again, brains working in dollars for some reason, then yeah, it's a big, it's a big cost investment. Exactly. It's a lot cheaper than a complete redesign of a board for 256 micro stepping as well. I don't think it's expensive if you only have a cheap printer, but if you have a high end printer, say you spent enough money to make Steve, that's probably 500, 600 pounds or dollars because they're approximately the same now. Then if you were to spend an extra 50 to get that much better functionality, Personally, I wouldn't be that upset by that. I think that's actually a pretty reasonable investment.
He is an investment. It is still a lot more expensive. But I, I'd probably pay that. Ooh, right. Well, that's not really ideal. Now I've got to try and get it flat. It's not the easiest thing. Just for those that don't know what I'm doing here, this when you tap something, you can see that one's slightly higher because it has to travel some distance, which means it makes a tapping sound rather than just the desk sound. It's probably vibrating through the microphone, so sorry about that. So I need to rotate it that way so I, so I can just I think that's probably good enough. <laughs> I think I'm just going to leave it at that. Have I made it correctly? That's the question. Or have I put something in the wrong place? Yeah, that looks pretty reasonable. So, any comments about this? I mean, no, all of this stuff's pretty easy to get. I mean, if it's your first printer and you want to make a clone, then getting the printed parts is obviously less easy because you can't just buy them, but you can just buy them from 3D hubs. So it's not difficult. Just download the Prusa i3 Mark II S files, extract the STLs, get rid of the ones that you feel you don't want or need maybe, or just get the whole set. Give them over to Sonic 3 hubs, ABS if you want ABS. Material, pay, get them back, job done. Not too bad at all. You still need to make some modifications to your board if you get them, and the software support is not there yet. Yeah. Yeah. Still dreaming really, aren't we? Why is this one still not flat? <laughs> it's impossible to get them flat. How do we make this one go down? And this one. I think we'll just leave it, it's fine. <laughs> so, I'm sure the correct placement, the y-axis rear stage has to be closer to the double nuts. Yes. Given dimensions are recommended, not absolute, use them for your guidance for assembly, your final values can differ slightly. So now they want me to have my frame, so the frame Insert the Y axis stage into the frame as close to Y corners as possible, then type the M8 nuts. Rotate the Y axis stage and repeat. Oh, okay. Just to get the right width dimension. But that's the M10 nuts, not the M8. Oh no, sorry, M8. It is, yep. Playing around with my own redesign of the main board. Somehow none of the boards on the market fit my needs. Which main board is that that you're looking at changing? So now I get to show you this. So this is a, let's change the camera. Ta-da. Sorry, sorry, sorry for the moving. So this is a frame. That is for a big, thick, six mil aluminium printer frame. I've got two of these, so I can have one for this printer. Because so the, the idea of this frame was 
two things. One, to be very solid. Two, to fit the Mark II S bed, the Mark 42 bed, sorry. And three, to be adaptable. So you can either use the full frame or you can just use all the holes that are from the original Prusa i3, or you can have sort of a combination of some and some. So it sort of gives you some options regarding some things. So we can just slip this in here. Yes, yeah, so I haven't got that dimension quite right, have I? Okay. Yes, that's interesting because I got the dimension pretty much spot on from what they said. So, what about this one? Oh, well, that's just screwed everything. <laughs> I can't get it out. There we go. Okay. So, oh, sorry, sorry. So, having thought that was sort of done, I do now need to loosen these inmates so I can scratch that sounds quite ambitious but I mean if it's something you do the same sort of thing that you do at work then these things suddenly seems tremendously less ambitious there we go Trinomic TMC 2208 drivers, STM 3GF4 microcontroller. Highly experimental. I love the words highly experimental, as in it doesn't really work at the moment. <laughs> it works sometimes. That's what I like to see. Highly experimental means you've already burnt the house down once at least. <laughs> but only once, that's the important thing. <laughs> was to port the 32-bit version of Marlin to it, but I'm a lot less proficient in software than in hardware, so progress is slow. So presumably, yeah, I mean, I'm almost entirely hardware. Any software knowledge I have is purely from just tinkering around, tinkering around, you no know, like education background or business or page bit or work or anything. It's just 
I like tinkering with it, so I'm using it. That's. <laughs> but funny enough, it's got me some places. Sometimes, good enough is good enough. If that makes any sense. You know when anything is good enough. As long as you can do something, you're the expert. <laughs> Step eight, step seven, sorry, step seven, step eight, step nine, step eight. Video for step eight. Insert the Y axis stage into the frame as close to Y corners as possible. What? Oh. <laughs> step nine. <laughs> What, where's the logic here? Okay, so this is step eight, right? It tells you to put it in and adjust in the M8 nuts and flip it around and do the same on the other side to make sure that this distance is correct. Step nine is a video for step eight. If, it, <laughs> if a video is the best way to explain step eight, why not make the video on step eight? Surely there's some logic that applies there somewhere. Oh, excuse me. Oh. Into the wire axis rods, adjust the tighten. After tightening the nuts, there shouldn't be any gap between the eight millimeter rods and the Y axis corners. So this is the bit that confused me a bit. This is not just gonna go in, is it? I'm going to have to now loosen the blooming N10s to get this in. Ooh. Ooh, you can't see what I'm doing. Switch back, switch back, quick. There we go. This fit now. Just take the whole end off. Same this side. So it feels like I'm going backwards now. I do feel like these instructions could probably be a little bit better. Like, why not put it put this in the first time you do this? Why we leave it till now, where you have to take everything apart to put it all back together. Little things. That's not work. Well, there we go. Looks pretty good. I've put these on and there's no bearings on it. What? I'm not going to have to take it all apart to put the bearings on. Why is this not in the instructions? 
Sorry, while I just have a little bit of a rant. Do the things, put the bearings on, do that. Yeah, can't say I agree totally with this instruction method. Let's flip it back over. To be fair, I probably should have thought of it, thought of it myself. But the fact that it, the instructions, the actual way to do it is to put everything on three times, seems a little bit daft. I'd like to think that the instructions for Steve are a little bit better than that. <laughs> Maybe. So how people are still joining now, I suppose, whatever time becomes convenient. Right, where are the bearings? Now I should probably try and clean these out a bit. So these bearings are literally the cheapest of the cheap. I don't recommend them, but they are okay. Headphone users, warning for screechy sounds. That's just not that bad, is it? These bearings are dry as a bone. Normally when you do this, you get rather like the manufacturing grease that comes out the ends. But there's nothing, nothing. <laughs> oh. I'm gonna just put a bit of grease in there with a zip tie. <laughs> do as I say, not as I do. Which one did I do? Hang on, let's do getting ahead of myself. Let's take all the bearings and rub them a little bit. Yep. Who was here for last week's stream and saw our discussion about the and or not website? Was anyone else here for that? Please don't tell me if this is advisable or not. I know it's probably not, but. These bearings should have at least some lubrication in them. Although this lithium, is it lithium? I'm pretty sure it's lithium grease, yeah. It's probably a bit thick, but is better than being super dry, which they are at the moment. Yeah, okay, so last week we had a bit of a discussion about somebody else, where's the best place in the UK to buy PEI? Because it's not very easy to buy. Certainly in the UK, it's not very easy to buy. Don't know why it's like elsewhere, because <laughs> for obvious reasons, I'm not elsewhere. Hang on, sorry, just let me sort out which way around this is going. Yeah. That's that side, so that's, no, hang on, that can't be right. 
that's that side. So there's two this side. Uh, yeah, so last week we had a bit of a discussion about where was the cheapest place in the UK to buy PEI. And I said, I've no idea. Because PEI is quite difficult to buy here. So I don't really know where the best place is. I've just found, as soon as I found a place, I bought it from there because it was the only place I could find. Somebody then suggested a website called And or Not, which is a bit of an odd name for a website, but regardless, they did seem to stock a couple of beds and PEI. I just wondered if anyone had picked any of that up. Because I actually made a purchase from their website in the end. Yes, PEI for the bed, yeah, yeah. He did bed PEI. It's something I actually quite like. I've started using PEI on that Cintron behind me and found it works pretty well. Wow, these bearings are unbelievably grimy. All that grease that I've just put in has all just come out in dirt. <laughs> well, what, what can you say? Yeah, has anyone else bought anything from and or not or found any other place to buy PEI in the UK? I bought a couple of things from there. I bought firstly the PEI, uh, an 8x8 eight eight sheet for, in fact it's going to be, I've got a Mark 42 bed but I've got two Prusas that I'm building so one's going to have the Mark 42, the other one's going to have a, a small standard bed with that PEI on it. And I also bought I also bought their like their own build surface. No idea how good it is. Because I just don't. Haven't had a chance to test it yet. As I said, moving house, packing up, you know, that sort of thing. Can't do it at the moment. But I'm looking forward to testing their own proprietary build surface. It looks Yes, I know, not the way to do it. <laughs> Why is it not there? Oh, it's probably this. Yes, it was. <laughs> so, yeah. If anyone's tried it before, have they? Good to know. Stop being silly. It's not a place for silliness. I forgot which end I need to be tiny. <laughs> it is this end, isn't it? So, this, so we're quite an interesting point in the build now for one component alone, and that's these 33 by 20 by 16 U shaped bolts. I cannot find anywhere where you can buy. I'm guessing you don't have Amazon or they stock differently there in the UK. Yeah, Amazon don't sell PEI here in the UK. You have to import it from America, unfortunately. So yeah, just insert these U-shaped bolts. I can't find, unless my Google Foo is really bad, which I don't think it is, you can't buy these anywhere. 
M3 U-bolts just don't seem to exist. I've looked so many places and I'm not going to buy custom U-bolts to make a printer, but it'd be quite nice to have the same as what's on it. But you think, oh, it's just a standard U-bolt. There's nothing particularly special looking about any of those dimensions. But it just seems to be pretty much impossible to get, which is a bit of a shame. At the moment, I haven't come up with, well, at the end of the day, I'll probably end up printing something for obvious reasons, because, yeah. But for now, I'm just going to zip tie it on. After all, on the original printer, they did just zip tie them down, so it can't be that bad, can it? Boom, boom, boom. Doesn't look too bad at all. These are proper zip ties, with by the way, not the uh, not Chinese zip ties. Chinese zip ties are pretty much useless. By Chinese zip ties, I mean the ones that you buy from somewhere like AliExpress, and you pull them tight, and they just snap into two pieces, <laughs> thus making themselves pretty much redundant. Yeah, the printed part will have more contact area, but a metal part would have better durability, I think. Probably. I mean, as, I mean, printed parts and zip ties, same sort of element. What am I talking about? I'm blabbering. They're both made of plastic, so they'll both wear out eventually. And they'll probably both wear out a lot quicker than a metal part, especially because of their proximity to the heat source, the heated bed. They will degrade due to the heat cycling. Probably, I don't know for sure, but presumably there's a reason why Prusa started using U-bolts, and I would imagine the degradation of these being the primary reason. Because, I mean, just like that, they work pretty well. Um, here, down here, around here, through here. Desk building, sorry. Completely skipped you out of that step. It looks there like it's really not flat. There's some. It's definitely flat. If I turn it round, does it look like it slopes the other way? Yes. <laughs> the, the camera definitely looks like that's sloping this way, but I can assure you it's flat. Oh, one thing they did say, orientation of the bearings, which I didn't check. Damn it. So one of the things they mention on the instructions is that the bearing, which has four parts for the sliding bearings within them, the balls, to make sure that the load direction coincides with one of those lines of bearings, lines of balls. Not exactly sure why, that doesn't seem particularly important. I mean, they're linear bearings that are all designed to be used around <laughs> in this manner, so I'm not sure how much difference that makes. Yeah, there is a slight fish eye, yeah. quite a wide angle. I mean, this lens is not very far away. 
about one and a half times the length of this Vimeo. So it's about that far away. Not very far at all. So tighten down the bearings of the carriage. Mine's just zip tied. Assembly of the Y idler. So the Y idler looks a bit like that. They do in fact use a smooth one. I would have normally chosen a toothed one, but I wanted to make it exactly the same as the Prusa. Down to the very last detail. So I have in fact gone for this one, regardless of the fact of it being better or not. And to tighten this on, you don't need much. A couple of washers, a couple of nylocks. Daisy. Damn it. <laughs> Come on. Oh, the, <laughs> the hole's a bit tight. The, the STL for this part. So you can see what the part is. I'm sure you know what it looks like. The STL for this part has weird shaped holes. Like everything else is circular like it should be, but these were like literally six sided holes, a hexagon, which is not a bad shape for printing, but they put it in like the worst orientation. So yeah, print quality of this part is never gonna be good. So interesting choice, but that's what it is. So yes, for this build, I am blindly following all the things on the Prusa manual and then for my my big my big boy six millimeter frame I'll be improving those little things probably the Allen key Yeah, the thick base for the uh, for the bed makes a massive difference. That was one of the first upgrades I did to my ooh, I've ever tightened that a bit. My Cintron, which you can see probably in the background, the the bed for that it was only three mil, three mil aluminium. But from the difference between that and just four mil acrylic was massive. Like you wouldn't expect it to be that significant, but really. It made a big difference to the quality of the prints. Not as thin as the build plate. Yeah, build plates are even worse. The, my one actually came with a Mark II, Mark II A. It was a three mil aluminium, so again, pretty reasonable. But the, it sort of heated the acrylic and the acrylic just sort of deformed a little bit. Three mil's all right, isn't it? I mean, it's not the best, but for a bed that's got to move back and forwards, I wouldn't want anything too over the top. I mean, <laughs> he says with a six mil build plate, but there you go. Seeing lots of u bolts on eBay. Stephen, is that in UK? If it's eBay UK, then that might have solved me problems. Maybe I am just very bad at Googling things. Can you look up sellers on eBay or do you just have to look up items? Uh. 
I am having a look right now. Shop. Oh, he has nice hexagonal weld nuts. Oh, he does all the things. Let's have a quick look for some U bolts, stainless U bolts. Very mil by eighty. Yeah, they they don't look like they have a very long thread though. U bolt plate. Yeah, the guys in Plymouth. Yeah, these are marine U bolts. Well, I suppose they're not. They're not far off. They are a bit long. I suppose you can cut them down, but eighty is very long. Three mil by eighty and nineteen. What size is the twenty sixteen? Three twenty and sixteen. Okay, thanks for that. I might try and pick some of those up and if they're not the right size then I'll have to keep looking, but thank you for giving me a little bit of assistance there. Always appreciated. Yeah, I'll see if I might order some of those and see if they fit. No harm in trying. So we've got this on. It's funny how they give, look, this is the actual way they say to do it. Use pliers. Since when do you use pliers to hold a nut? Literally never. That's not the right way to tighten a nut. But, I mean, at the worst, you'd think they'd have printed like a tiny little tool. <laughs> How difficult could that have been? Oh, use pliers. No, no, never use pliers to tighten a nut. Literally the worst idea ever. <coughs> Because, I mean, pliers are not parallel, are they? They're, they're, they're like scissors shape. Okay, what we got next? One motor. Place the motor temporarily in the frame next to the wire motor part. See the picture. Take the motor distance and place it at the very end of the motor casing. The two half circle knots on the Y end motor casing printed part must be facing the threaded rods. See the second picture. Take the motor away and press the wire motor distance printed part toward the threaded rods all the way in. See the third picture. Note the correct orientation of the cutout for the motor wires. It's very important. It is recommended to use the motor labelled Y axis as you will need it for the next step. So basically my type of stepper motor they're saying is not going to work because it has a little different cable thing. I mean there are two different types as far as I know. Well, apart from being six pin, four pin, this is oh well, it's a six pin motor, but only four of them are used. Uh, some have connector like this, JST connector, and some have just wires that come straight out. I actually prefer. I mean, you'd think the ones with the JST would be better because you can unplug them and just swap out the motors. But the inconvenience of this extra bit of plastic here is actually sort of outweighed by that ability in my mind. I quite like the fact that you can have those cables almost flush to the motor. Certainly unless you squeeze them in smaller places. So this is the little bit it wants me to put on. It's like, do this and measure this and get this about like this and do this and do that. Is this presumably on the original one. Yeah, so there has it has this little notch in it and that little notch is just supposed to line up with the wires that come out of here. So it sort of lines up and goes like that, stops the wires being crushed against it. Whatever. <laughs> mine's not going to be able to go that way around anyway. In fact, mine's going to have to go completely the wrong way and point forwards. Because that's the only way it can go. Unless I get some different motors, which I might, because reasons. Uh, and then push it on. That is, it actually fits pretty well. Because singer is just a push fit. Push fit always means afterthought, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Nearly always. Nearly always. Uh, so yes, that was difficult. 
and then some more M3 screws. Where are my screws? That's worked out weird. Oh yes, because I don't need. Yeah, I've got I've got more nylon dots than I need because I've not used them for the uh, the U bolts, obviously. This is not exactly the right stepper, and I know that. I'll probably switch out another time, but for the purpose of today's build, I'm just going to be using the one I had closest to me. Now, I personally don't think that this motor is very well supported. If it was me, I'd want it a little bit better supported than this. I upgraded, upgraded, changed my... Uh, uh, support on this one for my Cintron, my first printer, because the well, first it was this part here, and because let's have a quick. Can you see? Okay. So the belt goes from here up this way, and because this is pulling this way, the motor goes this way. Yep, like that. So I printed sort of this effect, but off the back of here, so it was all joined into one part. Now they've obviously changed because they've got this, which I didn't have on mine. And so they've added a separate part there. Now I still think that motor should be a little bit better supported than just those two fixings. I don't see any reason why it can't come round at least to this third fixing here. I'd, I'd like to see that personally. But at the end of the day, it's more plastic for them to print, it takes longer, costs more. So if they feel they don't need it, then they just won't bother. It's not to say they should bother if they don't need it. But. This is not very accessible. Pies are a recipe to screw up nuts. You probably said that five minutes ago. Sorry, I never saw it. <laughs> But yes, the people that use, when you see someone using pliers to tighten a nut, you're just like, you clearly have no idea what you're doing. <laughs> it's immediately obvious. Yeah, that's actually pretty sturdy. Maybe it doesn't need the extra mounting holes. It's quite a nice. Imagine this being six mil aluminium going to be badass. The Prusa i3 clone I have came with an acrylic carriage plate. Yes, that's so did mine. I ended up warping it the first time I tried to print ABS. I immediately got a replacement in aluminium. You're not in the UK, were you, Robert? So you probably didn't buy one of mine. Although I did ship mine quite far across the world, so it's possible, depending on how long ago it was. If it was a few months ago, then it's quite possible that was one of mine you bought. Unless it wasn't from the UK, in which case, almost certainly wasn't mine. But I did sell how many? Just shy of 50 of them. So, I mean, quite a few people wanted them. No, no, <laughs> no, it wasn't yours. Go away. Got it on Amazon. Fair enough. Uh, Now it's saying the motor cable and the wire cable. I'm just going to put this in. Cables can all be done another time. I can do cables. I'm a big boy now. That said, I've lost my screws. I mean, to be honest, I don't really care what they say about where to put the cables. I can sort that for myself. It's not difficult. As long as I don't get in the way of the motion, then It'll be just fine. Mm. So these are tiny little M2 screws. Well, they're pretty long, but they're not going to line up either by the looks of it. 
Yep, just. I'm not surprised that they have to charge so much for the assembled kits. I mean, the fact that it has so many parts, it must take someone so long to assemble this as part of a like factory assembly. It's craziness. Oopsie daisy. How are we doing for time? Six o'clock. Have we really been going two hours? Wow. <laughs> okay, well, the plan was to have a two hour stream, so. I mean, this is coming to a close, so we can bring everything to a close pretty soon, I think. That's cables. What assemble the Y belt holder? This is not going to be particularly easy now that it's all assembled. See, <laughs> why would they not tell you to do this? Like, this should. Okay. If I'd have followed the instructions, I would then assemble this to here and then try and assemble all of that to something that's already assembled. Like I've already tightened all of this and done all of that. This is all finished. Why <laughs> this instruction should be like right back up at the top before you put the things in, before you put the linear rails in. So I'm moaning now and I'll stop. But I still think it should not be like that. <laughs> okay, so that faces towards the single side. That goes on that way. I can't remember which holes. Because I've got quite a few holes in here. So I should probably mark which ones are like original Prusa holes. But I didn't add any screws for this. <laughs> Sorry about that, skip through the wrong things. M3 by 12 screws. Let me just go fetch some of those. Here we go, a couple of cap head screws. Mm, print quality is not too good on this part actually. The uh, the holes they're not quite the right size, so the hole ah, they don't really go in. Probably should have checked this before the stream, but now you get to see my ultimate three D printing tool, a tiny little knife which is literally. The best tool in the world. There you go. That solves that problem. There we go, that fits much better. Both of them? Yes. So which way around are we going? Towards the single side, which is that side. And this hole, like this. Now it should go back like this. those that don't know the size like the switching restrictions on this Prusa thing are pretty ridiculous like the the switch literally triggers just as the whole lot gets to the very end of its travel I'm gonna need probably some long screws for this <laughs> So I thought this bed on the original printer was six mil. It turns out it's actually only five. So. Mine is a little bit long, so these screws are not fitting as well as they should. But
Okay. Don't you just hate it when you just drop something and it just disappears? Oh, don't worry, I found it almost immediately. I know you can't see this, it's just <laughs> right under the most difficult place to assemble. Okay. things, assemble that, make sure that mark is in the right place, which it is, set the zip ties, more zip tying, no we don't use that one, we've got grease all over it, zip tie all the things, see this is funny in that when you've got expensive components, I'll just zip tie and it'll be, it'll be fine, don't worry about it. this way, this goes this way. Tighten a little bit afterwards. Now the belt. I think I'll do the belt probably a different time because I might need some modifications to this. Apart from that and cable ties, I think we're pretty much done. Yeah, I think that'll do for today. A couple of little bits to finish it up. Wires I've got to do obviously because they're not. These are not perfectly matching motors. Finish off tightening these zip ties. Yep, wrap the cables and put the belt in. The belt I've got, but I'm not going to do that right now because I might because I might have to change the stepper motor and yeah, it's better to just do it at a different time. I think. Whew. So I think that's going to be it for today. There won't be any additional video this week, as I said. I'm moving house so everything although it doesn't necessarily appear it from the background because i've not tidied that yet i am going to be moving house next weekend so there might not be any content at all next weekend uh so i think that's going to be it for today thank you very much for joining me along the journey especially to those who were here last week as well thank you for joining me that's a solid four hours of your time i think i might have absorbed already it's great though that lots of people are happy to watch that makes it much is really worth doing when there's people that actually care to stay and join me and have a conversation about 3d printing especially when you're on the other side of the world thank you <laughs> right i guess i'm gonna call it there then unless anyone else has any more questions i think that's all for today Thanks very much for watching. This has been CRT. I think I might stop doing that. I'm not sure if I like it anymore. <laughs> See you in the next one. Bye everyone. How do I stop this thing? How do I stop?